Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bill and Eamon's Bogus Hangout. We have uh, our guests introduce themselves. Terry? Terry Van Horn. Uh, retired, I guess. Doc? Doc Sheldon, and I probably should be, but... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm um, Bill Slossy, and I'm planning on retiring. Not right now, though. So we've got too many things going on. I'm the author of SEO by the Sea and the director of SEO research at Go Fish Digital. And Terry, you've got some plans, even though you're retired. You've got some stuff you're working on. Anything you want to talk about? Mm. Not really. I, I'm going to do it, just still kind of looking at things, figuring it out. And uh, still, it's only been a couple of months since I hung it up, so I'm still kind of, you know, working the stress off. Well, SEOs have always seemed to have a long history of having side projects and like affiliate programs and stuff like that. It's people worked with clients and, and they've supplemented their own, own income by working for themselves, building things. Yeah, or they were using that to test their uh, theories, using those sites to test their theories. I do that to some in some respects with what I still have. But I'm looking at the, uh, one thing I was doing last week was I was uh, looking at the domains I own, yeah. trying to decide what to do, and I couldn't believe how, some, how much some of them were worse. So, uh, That's a nice surprise, eh? Yeah, yeah. Especially uh, two or three of them uh, that I've had for like 20 years. Oh, no. Like like a uh, single word, memorable type names that people might actually bid money on? Yeah, SEOpros.com is one of the ones I want to sell. Yeah. And a lot of other people have bought names around it. But uh, that's still the best one. So do you price out like you price a house? You look for comparable domains? Uh, you can't find comparables to that. I found uh, one com maybe comparable is, uh, I think it was UX something. It, it had to do with uh, UX, right? And it was a good domain name. And they at, were asking 27000 and 20000 had been bid. Yeah. So if you look at, the dollar amounts that those industries bring in, if that's worth 27 SEO pros has got to be worth a lot more. Probably a safe bet, yeah. So uh, that's how I plan to pay for my funeral. <laughs> You're carrying planning ahead just a tad too far there, buddy. Uh, nope, because... A uh, friend of mine's parents died, and I don't want to leave anyone in that kind of shape. Yeah, yeah. And I want it done the way I want it done. So uh, the only way you can <laughs> do that is to give someone a, you know, pay for it all in advance and give someone specific instructions. I bought a $25 membership in the California Cremation Society about 40 years ago. So that, that's covered. And then in my will, I left specific instructions that I want my ashes scattered at the HVAC air intake at the federal building in Los Angeles. <laughs> that would lead to somebody getting arrested now, would it? Not my problem, mate. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that it was against the law to do that. So I had to find a friend who I know I could trust to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have my ashes scattered. <laughs> Where? 
No, I didn't realize it was illegal. It's illegal to have your ashes scattered or yes. in a particular place? Yep. That's what I was told anyhow. Yeah, it has to be done, in the States, it has to be done by somebody who is licensed for it. Like, for instance, if you want your ashes scattered at sea, yeah. basically anybody can take your ashes out to sea as long as they go out past the 12-mile limit. Right, because then they're in international. Then they're in international waters, and there's no right. international law that governs it. But uh, here in Mexico and here in the United States, uh, both are required. They have to have a special license, and there's limitations on where and when and how. And I'm pretty sure the L.A. Federal Building doesn't fall within those <laughs> limitations. <laughs> yeah, mine's a place in uh, so Vancouver who, Harbor. Who would, who would carry one of those licenses, like a clergy member? Say again, Bill? Who would carry one of those licenses, like a clergy member? No, there's, there's services out there that, that uh, handle that. And, and for instance, I know that there's a, a fishing uh, charter service in Long Beach. That, that's one of the services that they provide. And I went on a fishing trip one time, and they actually scattered some ashes off the stern while we were out there. It's just kind of a peripheral service that they offer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to pay more for that? Yeah. And they just asked everybody to pull their line out of the water and observe a moment of silence, and they chucked them out there into the wake, and <laughs> we went back to fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear. But, like, I know that some people have wanted their ashes scattered over a particular city or something like that, and that just, you can't do that. No. Yeah, I wouldn't do something like that. <laughs> Mine's more going in the water in the harbor. Yeah, I, you know, I figure it's, I'm not going to be terribly interested in where I end up. You know, it's yeah. kind of like, it's kind of like if you get ripped asunder by a grizzly bear, does it really matter to you that whether he eats you or not? Yeah. <laughs> I, but I hear you. You know, I, I definitely I don't want to leave. I, I've seen so many people die without a will. Yeah. And, and it, it just leaves the family with what can be a crushing expense, you know. I mean, you can't even, even to bury the remains of a family member on your own property, if you're in the county, not in a, in, in a municipality, but I mean, if you live out in the county someplace, in most states, it's very difficult. If you haven't got a, a family lot, you know, a cemetery plot already designated as such on your property, it's somewhere between very difficult and impossible to get the right to do that. Now there's serv you've seen some of these services that now they offer these things while well, they'll, they'll cremate you and they'll, they'll put your ashes into a seed pod and, and they give you this pod and you can go plant it and a pine tree will sprout up or something, you know, and uh, those guys too, they have to get some special, special permits to be able to do that. And then where you can do it, may be limited by your local laws, you know. I have to look up my local laws concerning that. Well, I imagine that, you know, getting your, anything besides your ashes scattered at sea would be challenging around the California coast. I'm, I'm curious about how they'd phrase it. Yeah. Yeah, from your perspective, I can see where that would be interesting. <laughs> I forget the the uh, federal agency that that deals with that. It, I remember that it surprised me who it was. I mean, I would have figured it might have been something like, you know, some health, public health service or something like that, but it wasn't, and I can't remember. It was EPA. Now. No. I'll call tobacco and firearms. <laughs> no, that they would be the ones probably the root cause of the death. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. I don't remember who it was now, but I remember I was being surprised. I said, that just didn't make sense that that would be the agency overseeing that. But I'll have to look it up. Now I got my, I piqued my curiosity again.
Not not the Environmental Protection Agency, huh? No, it wasn't. Public Health or Environmental Protection Agency. It was. I don't recall. It's been it's been a few years since I looked it up. Department of Human Services. No. No, it was a. I mean, it was a total off the wall affiliation. I mean, like bridges and highways or mine service or something like that. I mean, just, it's just a no connection whatsoever that made any sense. <coughs> but I've just, you know, I've seen so many people die without a will. Yeah. And, and that just can be not only catastrophic cost wise to the family. I mean, when they least need another distraction to try to deal with, but it could also just tear a family apart when everybody starts fighting over, well, I want this and I want that. And he always promised me I could have this. And yeah, which, should say, you know, brothers and sisters are at each other's throats. What's truly difficult is trying to work with uh, institutions like banks after yeah. they pass away. Yeah. Because they make it really hard to get any money from them. They do that. I think I talked to you, I think last week about, you know, when I, I was the executor for my mom and who did have a will. Yeah. And it was still a year long process by basically by statute. I mean, they've, they've built in a year long delay in the process in California. And it was still challenging. And I found out that I was really quite fortunate. Things went pretty smoothly by California standards. <laughs> Part of the problem is you have to account for problems that happened during their lifetime. Yeah. That nobody ever anticipated. Like my father had his own corporation. He had a, a, a business partner, so he, he uh, had a, a board of directors that included more than just him. He had one other person. And that guy passed away like 10 years before he did. And I was able to get a death certificate for him without having a social security number. After I wrote the Pennsylvania Department of Health, the long letter explaining that I had a financial interest in having his death certificate. So I can prove the, to the bank that he'd passed away. And that will help me close the bank account. Problem. Joint bank account? No, no. It was bank account in the business's name. Oh. Uh, so required two signatures. No. It it no. They required the uh, articles in corporation. And if they had the articles in corporation, they could tell that there was one person or two people or more people involved. There's only one person. And I'm the executor of my father's estate, then I could stand for him as the uh, uh, director of the business. And I could have a minutes meeting and I could close, I could uh, declare that the bank account was going to be closed. And the bank would close the bank account. So that was, that was reasonable. Yeah. It makes sense. What doesn't make sense is. My father incorporated this business in 1993. There was another guy in, and he incorporated in the uh, state of New Jersey. There's another guy who started a business by the same name, incorporated in, in New York, and then forgot which state he incorporated it in and filed articles of dissolution in New Jersey to dissolve it. Oh, wow. So the New Jersey division of corporations dissolved my father's corporation. Didn't tell okay. him. Just dissolved it. He kept on running the business without knowing that. But they officially have it as a dissolved corporation. I sent them a letter showing proof that it was still a going business that that the guy who had filed the uh 
certificate of dissolution uh, was a New York corporation, not in New Jersey. I sent that to them about three weeks ago. I haven't heard back from them yet. <laughs> I, I mean, I assume that after that dissolution was misapplied that your dad continued to pay his franchise taxes and everything on the corporation. Yeah. You would think that somewhere along the line, somebody would have said, why are you paying taxes on a dissolved corporation, wouldn't you? Nah. <laughs> like the accountant you work with, who wasn't a very good accountant. Apparently. Yeah. But so, I think uh, if you're trying to reopen a corporation and you haven't paid your registration fees, if it, registration fees are supposed to be paid with your state taxes for your business. Yep. And I'm not sure if they were. I don't know that. You had an accountant who was supposed to be working with them to do that stuff. But New Jersey sort of penalized people who haven't been paying their uh, registration by charging them $500 a year as opposed to 50. So if he hadn't been paying it for the last <coughs> 15 years or so, uh, they could charge me $50 a year or they could charge me 500 a year. Mm. I'm supposed to make sure it's up to date before I'm allowed to dissolve it. And they're saying it's already dissolved. Why would I? No. <laughs> Dodge that bullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm supposed to uh, hold a minutes meeting, standing for my father as a director, and close a bank account. If there's not enough money in the bank account to uh, make it worthwhile, uh, do cover whatever it might cost close to reopen the corporation yeah. and then close it. And walk away from it, man. It's probably in best interest to walk away from it. Was, if was, anybody ever at the Division of Revenue from the state of New Jersey ever get back to me. When, uh, when my mom passed away, you, know, you, you file all the, these registered letters telling all creditors they've got, they got 30 days to respond and, you know, with any claims against the estate. And I had, I, don't know, I think it was like 13 or 14 different things. And, and most, most of them were zero balance, but she owed you know, seven or eight grand, all told. Yeah. And 13 or 14 responded, and then about... Jesus, it's got to be seven or eight months later. I get a letter from this this uh, revolving charge place that she had a, a an open balance of like thirty seven dollars and change, and they wanted their thirty seven dollars and change plus one hundred and eighteen or hundred no one hundred and twenty eight dollars in in uh, fees and penalties. And I said, well, you know, you were sent a letter on such and such a date. And you didn't respond. So your name didn't get put in a hat. You know, sorry about that. I suggest you write it off and take the tax benefit. <laughs> they said, well, we'll go after your mother. I said, well, you do that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, could you give us contact information? I said, yeah, she's in a small wooden box, box. on the bottom shelf of our Chinese uh, uh, cabinet. cabinet here and, and uh, if you can get her to answer the door you feel free to knock on a box <laughs> <laughs> they said they said three or four semi-threatening letters and then all of a sudden I got a notice finally that, that they had uh, they had uh, totally absolved her of the debt and zeroed it out <laughs> with with a very nice a single closing line about to our, our our condolences for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckheads. <laughs> somebody actually read something you sent to them. <laughs> yeah, almost a year later. Yeah. 
Well, I called, I called the court there in Santa Cruz and I said, okay, I got these guys contacting me and they were, you know, they were sent a letter on such and such date, registered letter. Here's the signature. You know, what do I do? He says, tell them to piss off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was one, one of the most fun guys I've ever had to do business with the clerk, clerk of court there in Santa Cruz. He was a hoot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking I need to talk to the clerk of the court in New Jersey about this uh, certificate of dissolution for corporation. Well, you know, the, the, the clerk of court can send a forceful letter to yeah. them, tell them to, to get off their ass and respond to you promptly, and it would probably carry some weight because probate courts do have some teeth. Yeah. And, you know, basically he could tell them, I, you know, whether he would do it without the judge's say so or not, I doubt, but, but he could tell them, you know, you either do it by such and such date or, you know, we're, we're going to find that X, you know. I want to save that card for another bank account that I'm trying to close for him. They, they made me send death certificates to my parents and they made me send the executor's certificate they're telling me to get the money out of the bank account. I need to file a, a tax waiver form, which includes the amount of money in the bank account. I don't know the exact amount of money in the bank account. And I've asked them more than a dozen times. And they won't tell me. Huh. But they won't do anything until I send them that form. Catch 22, eh? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I sent the last uh, letter up to them certified so I can send a copy to the clerk of the court. Right. So I sent it certified to them. And they won't tell me the amount I need to use in this form. I was, I was lucky in that because my mom used uh, the bank that she used my aunt, her sister-in-law, was the vice president of operations for that bank. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have any prob trouble getting the information we needed, you know. But, uh, yeah, the bureaucracy can, can be a real pain in the butt. With And, and most people that end up getting named as executor, yes. you know, they're not an attorney. They, they've never done this before. They've, they've, nobody would ever do it twice by choice, you know. <laughs> So a lot of people, they're just totally lost and they basically have to accept whatever they're told. And, you know, if, if, if the clerk is a, a jerk, they can, they can really run you around. And I would imagine, you know, for a clerk to deal with that kind of stuff day in, day out, it's easy to become a jerk. Yeah. You know, it's not the most pleasant thing to work with. And, I asked that guy, that, that he was a clerk of the probate court there in Santa Cruz, and I asked him, how do you stay so cheerful? He says, oh, I drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you got, you got to be careful. He says, you're either, you're either going to scream or you're going to laugh. He says, yeah, it's, it's I can't tough. let this shit eat, eat at me. So It's tough working in the government office. He says, I figure most of the people I deal with, they've got enough on their plate right now. If I can just, you know, help them get one chuckle out of their day, it, you know, it's worthwhile. He, he was a great guy. I, I never, I was going to go drive over there and meet, meet him and take him to lunch or something. I never got a chance to actually meet him. But we had some fun phone conversations. <laughs> He actually said, he says, you're, you're lucky. He says, uh, they had two judges in Santa Cruz yeah. uh, of probate. And he says, you're lucky you're going before Judge Abrams. He says, Abrams is, is a good a good egg. Says, if you're going before this, uh, then you name the other judge. If you're going before this other guy, he says, he's a twat. You, he, you wouldn't want to be in his be before him. So the other thing I noticed uh, about government offices are 
government websites have terrible SEO. Oh yeah. And, and not great developers sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I would say the only thing worse than the SEO is the navigation and the yeah. thought that's put into them. If yeah. you're trying to find information on a government website, you can't Google it. You've got to go to the website itself and search around. Oh, you can find Google. Uh, actually, that's usually how I find stuff on the Canadian website is I'll Google it. The only thing you can't get to from there is some of the, like your personal account. Yeah. Well, they, they, government websites tend to label pages really poorly yeah. and use navigation, terms of navigation that don't have anchor text that reflect what's on the other side of the link. Yeah. So it, it means that the SEO on those sites is really terrible. And there's a lot of really useful information, like if I want to look up civil or criminal cases here in Delaware, I can go to the uh, Superior Court websites and uh, find a place to uh, put somebody's first name or last name and look them up. If I try to find the ability to do that in Google, it's impossible to find because the site's so poorly organized. Can't get, they're not indexing at all, you mean? You can tell when you're on a page of that site or one of those superior court websites that that's how that's how it functions but the words that they use don't describe it well they never grasp the keyword concept eh? <laughs> yeah they never grasp the concept of a clear value proposition explaining to people what the page is for and words they might understand yeah. uh, okay in the uh, uh, file name and the uh, description, that sort of thing, you mean? In the actual text on pages that a search engine... Oh, that's have. even worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad stuff. Oddly enough, a lot of that, or some of the American websites. I know the ones that uh, Obama did for Obamacare were made by a comp Canadian company. Yeah. Did a terrible job. Oh, it was, it was atrocious. That company terrible. almost, <laughs> the company got hit hard over it too. Well, they sure charged dearly for it though. Yeah, well, that's the way it is. A few hundred thousand dollars for a fucking website that won't someone, even operate? I don't care who it is. Anybody comes from the government, might as well have a big M on his uh, forehead for a mark. <laughs> you know, what's the usual price? 50 grand. Well, for the government, it'll be like 250 then. That, that should about do it. Well, you know what? I, I did a lot of government work back back in the day, and... I quoted a job one time for our company for, it was for 27 special systems and they were our, our normal cost with our normal markup of GNA and overhead and profit was going to be $181,000 each. And we called them, we sent them the bid and they decided to send a team down from Pax River to uh, visit our plant and sit down and negotiate a contract. When we got through that first day's meeting, in fact, we weren't even through with the meeting. We, just when we broke for lunch, the price was already at 402 per unit. I, you know, we standardly built at a 15% G&A overhead markup and a 10% profit margin. They would not allow that. They required 22% G&A and overhead and 18% profit as a minimum markup. Now, <laughs> These are the guys negotiating the best price for the government. Whose side are you guys on? <laughs> yep. I, I work for the court system in Delaware, and we were building a website. For the <coughs> court. 
And we knew that we had to write the text ourselves in a language that was understandable for people who might search because we'd get a phone call if we didn't. People would call us and ask us mm -hmm. if they would find something. We wanted to stop getting those phone calls. So we helped build the site. We helped write the text, the content. Made as easy to use as possible. Yeah, that's still when you're building a website where content comes, two people you should talk to, salespeople and the people who are taking the complaint calls. They're gonna and customer service. Yeah, when it's when it's a court website, you don't have salespeople. Okay, but for a norm like a regular company, you want to see the questions that the salespeople are being asked as well. Right, and we we were working on it. We were the people who the public talked to when they wanted information, so we knew what they were asking. Yeah, right. You're basically, you were customer service. Yeah. I mean, we were processing uh, warrants, we were sentencing people, we were handling bail. We knew all the questions, all the answers. Right. That's why they're the best source. Yeah. That's content that absolutely should be on the site because it's actually saving time and money as well as uh, helping make the sale. You make it as easy as possible for people to use a website so they don't have to make a phone call and talk to people and ask questions. Because when that happens, it can take forever. To me, right? A site that may not be very aesthetically pleasing, but is very easy to navigate and find stuff on, people yeah. will appreciate that more than the company that put a lot into the Ab aesthetics of the website. Absolutely. Because people, right, uh, a lot of designers don't really take that into, like people really don't care what your website looks like. And when I tried to tell that to owners, right, like I'd rather have a site that works well than one that's really, you know, a lot of money was spent on making the graphics and stuff. A, because that just 